Do you have a prepared thing? I do. How's that? I am being supplanted. <laughs> <laughs> so Bob Wood has been the executive director of the Oregon Christian Evangelistic Fellowship for nearly 20 years and served on the board for six years prior to that. He pastored the Redwood Christian Church in Grants Pass from 89 to 2004 and was the pastor before that at the Grangeville Christian Church in Idaho from 82 to 89. Now Bob and Sherry have two daughters and five grandchildren, and Bob and Sherry enjoy golfing together from time to time. So Bob, please come and share with us. Thank you, Dave. Well, some of you I have met other places, not just here, but some at the Oregon Christian Convention, some at some of the rallies we've had and around, because I see a lot of faces I recognize. But if I haven't met you yet, I'm Bob Wood, as Dave said, and Sherry sitting back here as well. But uh, hey, before I get into the message, just, I just want to say thank you. This congregation has supported church planting and church renewal in the state of Oregon for decades. Thank you for not only your financial support monthly, but Dave, I gotta tell you, Larry Moore was on our board forever, I think. In fact, when I first came on the board, oh man, 26 years ago, I think, Larry helped me uh, get acclimated to what we do as board members, and it was partly his fault that I now am the executive director. <laughs> we'll talk about that again someday in heaven, I'm sure. But uh, thank you for all that support. Let me, let me just give you a brief update on what's been going on, because there's a lot of things going on. We are, we, I'm picking on you too, we as Christians who live in Oregon are missionaries. And I know we don't think about that. We think of other places like Africa or wherever as missionaries. But Oregon, this is crazy. You've probably heard these numbers, but they are true. Oregon is the least churched state in the third largest unchurched nation in the world. Only China and India, I believe, <clears throat> have more unchurched people than America today. Now, Oregon, let's get this correct. Oregon is a very, we are filled with very spiritual people. We're very spiritual, we're just, <laughs> what spirit we worship is always uh, up for grabs. But it, I, I get asked all the time, why don't you move to another state where Christianity isn't so persecuted? That's exactly why we're here. Because this is a place that needs the gospel. The people need Jesus. And we sang about it this morning. He is the light that people need. And so it's fun to be a part of that. It's fun to see people coming to Christ. And again, we've been with OCF for in the director's chair, and Sherry does the administration. She works full-time also for OCEF. We have seen in our time with OCEF, now this is crazy, but in our church plants, let me, before I give you a number, church planting is very difficult because it requires finding a pastor who has an entrepreneurial ability to start something from scratch. Okay? We find a few of those, but that's been tough. But equally difficult is helping a church that's about ready to close or to give up or be taken over by another group to say, no, we need a solid Christian church in this community and help them get back on their feet. So we have church planting is one arm that we do, and then we call it our partnership ministry, but this is, I don't know, I have a better name, uh, church rescuing. Uh, <laughs> you get a lot of names for it, but a lot of our churches, we started our turnaround church ministry, I think 16 or 17 years ago, when it became obvious that we could not plant churches fast enough to keep up with the churches that were closing in Oregon. And I gotta tell you though, the miracle that we have seen, in our church plants, we've seen over 1,500 people come to the Lord and be baptized in the years that we've been with OCF. But I gotta tell you, the churches that were going to close and we've seen them come back to life, We've seen over 16, maybe 1,700 people come to Christ and be baptized in the churches that had contemplated closing. So over 3,000 people we've seen come to Christ 
be baptized in our year for those CF here in Oregon. Now, I know that 3,000 people coming to the Lord, 3,000 baptisms in 20-some years seems pretty impressive, but we know another place that did that in one day on the day of Pentecost, so we're not getting very prideful with this. We've got a lot of work to do, a lot of people yet to come to the Lord, but thank you for your participation in this ministry. And we continue looking. In fact, the biggest thing, I, if I was going to say, put this on your prayer list. Here's a big one. We need pastors, preachers. Now this goes across the board, not only with us, the Christian churches, the non-denominational churches, but across the United States, even in denominational churches, the well has all but run dry. And we have no one to blame. I can't blame the Bible colleges. They cannot train whom we do not send to them. This is on all of us. We need to be talking it up. And Sherry and I were trying to count how many of the young men uh, that have we've seen baptized that are now preaching in about a dozen, and young women that are now leading many ministries, children's ministries, executive ministries, and volunteer ministries, as well as whatever. That's rewarding. But we can't stop. It's like our kids need to be having kids. You see, that's the joy of grandparents. <laughs> and it needs to bleed over into our spiritual walk as well. We need to be bringing people to Jesus. And the people we bring to Jesus need to be bringing people to Jesus. You with me? <laughs> and you know, what the old people told us was true. I, I, now that I am an old people, I can say this for a fact. It applies over spiritual, but let me hit it in the grandchildren realm. Grandchildren are the reward for not killing your kids. <laughs> this is, uh, has become very true in my mind, but it is also in the spiritual realm. So, this is what we do together. If you have young people in your church, talk positive about the ministry. This is rewarding, isn't it? This is what we do. For life, for eternity. But we need more. We need others. So be excited about it. Hey, another area to pray. I noticed that somebody's pager went off. And apparently, is it firing? Yeah. We have three of our group rush out of here. I'm assuming there's an emergency. I don't know what. Four. I only saw three. So four had to leave. Let me just pray right now for whatever that emergency is and for our family that rushed out to help. Can we just pray? Whatever that is. Father, we know that you know everything that's going on around us, even when we don't. And Lord, four of our family had to rush out because there's an emergency. Something is going on. Lord, I know you're already there because you're everywhere at the same place, at the same time. So, Father, please be with those who are hurting. Be with those who are rushing in to help. Give them safety. Bring them home to us. The Lord, somehow, in whatever that crisis is, we pray that you will be lifted up, you will receive the glory, and that somehow in all this, somebody's going to get to know you here in this life so they can spend eternity with you later. Thank you for being there at the same time that you're here. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let me take you on a, on a little tour of OCEF, Oregon Christian Evangelistic Fellowship. So I'm going to just run through those four words briefly to tell you who we are, what we do, and what we're going to be doing, because you're a part of that. You have been supporting this mission for a long time. Pray that you will continue. In fact, do so even more so. Look for somebody that, I saw kids. I saw, I saw some kids go up. That could be our next crop of preachers and elders and, and psalm leaders. Keep encouraging them. So let me give you a little rundown on it. Who we are, what we are, etc., etc. I know this is this is pretty lame. Oregon Christian Evangelistic Fellowship. There's my outline. So let me just tell you where we minister is in Oregon, primarily in Oregon, but we're not afraid to go outside of Oregon if that's what the need is. But we have been ministering in Oregon. I told you that it is a great need. It is where people need Jesus and always will. But we have planted churches. The OCEF started really as something that came out of the Oregon Christian Convention in 1958, where the churches said, we believe we need to have a Christian church, 
a, a New Testament church, a church that believes the Bible is true in every community in Oregon. And yet our church has said, but by ourselves, we can't do that. So what can we do together, not as a denomination? <laughs> Sometimes people don't really make any difference. But a denomination, there is a hierarchy telling the churches what they have to do and what they have to believe. In the Christian churches, the church, the local church, is the authority. Well, Christ is the authority, but through the church, the OCEF does not exist to tell you what to do. We exist to support the church to be the body of Christ in this local place. Does that kind of make sense, what we do? We're not over the church, we are under the church. The church, the churches came together and said, let's do together what we can't do alone. And we started with church planting, and now it's church revitalization, turning churches around. And it has been, it has been, it will continue to be exciting. We have planted in other places other than Oregon, but I will tell you that... Uh, one of our recent church plants is in Medford, Oregon, Upward Christian Church. It's five years old, six years old. So it's, uh, it's still a toddler, if you will. But our church planter, after six years, actually in the fifth year, said, you know, I'm just not a pastor. I'm a church planter. I didn't know there was a difference. I'm sorry. I, I'm trying not to go there. But I said, okay. So we have been looking, we have found and recommended a pastor for their elders to consider, and he will start in Medford, September 1st. So he's coming on very soon. The elders have been doing a lot of the heavy lifting. I've been working with them, coaching them. They're the young elders. It's a young church. So kind of training them in how to be an elder and how to be a shepherd. And that's been really exciting. We planted three years ago, two and a half years ago, in Twin Falls, Idaho. And somebody said, why did you go to Idaho? Well, Eric Nielsen, who had been a church planter from 20 years ago in McMinnville, kids are out of the house. He says, we believe God's calling us to plant again. And so they went from Adventure Christian Church in McMinnville. And I don't know if they threw a dart at a map. I don't know how they picked Twin Falls. Um, but they picked Twin Falls. And we spent several years ministry in Idaho, and I think actually that was an area of great need. We had a couple of churches there, but they're about ready to close. And they some churches just think they got to die off. We don't need help. Leave us alone. <clears throat> Last person out, turn out the lights, and it's, it's kind of how they end. But uh, Eric is, has planted a, a thriving, exciting church. In fact, I get to preach there on Labor Day. I'll be over in Idaho and get to spend another opportunity with them, with this growing congregation that is reaching out to the other Christian churches, saying, how can we help you? Now, we're not in competition. How do we help you get stronger while we're growing as well? And so we have that church plant going, and the next church plant probably will be in Idaho. They put a church planter in training on staff immediately. And so they're looking to plant... They were hoping to go across the river and into Jerome, Idaho, but their church planner said, I don't want to live in Jerome, so they're looking at South Twin Falls. And I just, I laugh because I've worked with church planners for 26 years, so they kind of, it's, it's like herding cats. I'm not sorry. They, they kind of go wherever they want to, and, and praise God, uh, it, it usually works out. But we are the Oregon Christian Evangelistic fellowship and so we are in we are in Oregon this great mission field and I remember as a kid we talked about the, the need for Christianity to get to Africa. We call it deepest, darkest Africa because the gospel, the light of the gospel we thought hadn't been shining there. We have been to Africa. We have seen the success of the gospel in Africa. Today Africa has a higher percentage of Christians than Oregon. Percentage wise. Well, that's great for Africa. But here we are in deepest, darkest Oregon. But the, we have the light, who is Jesus. So keep it up. So we are the Oregon Christian. Now that may be, well, duh. Sorry, that's a Greek word. <laughs> Probably. And uh, Christian, not just that we believe in Jesus. Let me tell you about a little bit of our heritage. You, we, are a part of what was called the Restoration Movement or the American Reformation. 
the fastest growing religious movement in the history of the United States, and you're a part of it. And I know sometimes we're in our little cubby holes here, we go, well, it doesn't feel like the fastest growing. Well, it doesn't matter how it feels. The reality is, this is a movement where people said, can't we just believe the Bible? By the way, I was helping a, a church. I got a call from, and you may not know where this is. I didn't know where this was until I went there. Adrian, Oregon. Anybody? Ah, me either. Until I got a phone call. They said, we're a Presbyterian church in Adrian, Oregon, and we hear that you are a non-denominational organization. Can you help us out of the Presbytery? To which I said, that is way above my pay grade. <laughs> but if you are able to be out of a denomination, please call me. Because what happens with denominational churches where a hierarchy somewhere has told them what to believe and how to do everything and how to do, you know, how to do their church service. A lot of churches, when they pull away from that, don't know what to do. Some just stop being a church. They might become a club. Others become hyper-emotional because they just don't know what to do. So, praise God, they call. I had the opportunity, it was a Sunday after an Easter a few years ago, to preach. I said, I want to preach before the congregational meeting. They said, why? I said, I want people to see my heart and my love for Jesus before I talk business. <laughs> Preached, and then we had a congregational meeting with maybe about 25 people there. And I told them about this movement of churches from 200 years ago. Some Presbyterian or Baptist or Methodist, and people just said, can't we just believe the Bible? And when I said that they said, can't we just believe the Bible? This group of 25 people stood up and applauded. And I get goosebumps to this day thinking about it. That little church is in a community of, there's only 600 people in the entire school district. I didn't say students. 600 people in the entire school district. The church is running in excess of 60, 70, sometimes 80 people. Folks, that is a mega church. <laughs> Preaching Jesus. We got him connected to Boise Bible College. Adrian is right on the Snake River. Uh, Caldwell, I know, is kind of on one side. And we got him connected to Boise. And Boise sent some preachers. And I preached. And it's just fun to watch the transition of seeing a church come from, I don't know what I believe. And I'm not down on the Presbyterian or anybody else, by the way. They just sometimes miss the mark. And sometimes so do we. We get back to the Bible. So you are a part of what's called the Restoration Movement. We are Christian. I love the book that we have in Bible College. Did you have this one? Christians only. We are Christians only, but we are not the only Christians. You get that? That's who you are. And so thank you for being a part of this movement that believes that the Bible is the Word of God. That it is true. One of the things that has held us together is the fact that within our churches, we believe, you know, there's, there's wiggle room. We had, a, we had a phrase years ago, in essentials unity, in opinion liberty, and in all things love. And then we fought over what was essential and what was opinion, and we really didn't like each other at all. But let's, so let me boil it down. Maybe the word essential is where we got off, but folks, you are a part of a group of churches that believe that if something is connected to salvation in the Bible, if it's connected to the death of burial and resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, whether that be faith or baptism or repentance or living your Christian life on a daily basis, it is non-negotiable in our teaching. We don't compromise. We talked about baptism. We got a lot of churches who go, ooh, don't talk about baptism. It's just, you know, it's, an, it's, it's offensive. <laughs> yes, the gospel is offensive. We're going to talk about faith in Jesus. We're going to talk about God's grace these things are not negotiable in our teaching. But, you know, there's a lot of other things that are in Scripture. But, you know, it's, there's a command to greet one another with a holy kiss. And i got to tell you, I was grateful you didn't kiss me when I walked in. <laughs> I, you know, lift up holy hands while praying. Yes, if you want to. It was a command. 
But is it connected to salvation? No. So we're going to cut each other's slack. You want to lift your hands up, go ahead. At the appropriate times. <laughs> we are a part of a movement that lifts up the Bible. We are Christian. Okay? Amen. Oregon Christian, but here we, here's the why. Evangelistic fellowship. Evangelistic. The OCEF church planters, that's our big name, does not exist, number one, to plant churches or to restore churches or to rescue churches. We exist for the same reason that you are a Christian. We exist to reproduce Christ in other people. Evangelism. To see other people come to Christ. If bringing if planting churches didn't help people come to Christ, and if revitalizing churches did not bring people to Christ, then why do it? You know, the, they probably don't teach this in biology anymore. <laughs> that was as close to a political statement as I'm going to get this morning. <laughs> that I'm going to... See, when I was a kid, it was taught in your biology class that the purpose of everything living, the purpose of everything living, is to reproduce after its own kind. You remember that? In fact, in, oh, here's your Greek Bible word for the day. There's a word called, in, in the Greek, it's teleos. You don't have to remember that. It's translated perfect. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But th then we think perfect as in spotless. I can't do anything wrong. No, that's not what that word meant. The word teleos or perfect means to be able to reproduce ap after your own kind. We raised horses for years. We broke horses and got broke by horses. <laughs> when you got a two-year-old filly and you're breaking, she's great. But she's not perfect until she, until she drops a foal on the ground for us. You, thank you for nodding. You got that. That ability to reproduce. You see, that's what we're to do. We as Christians are to reproduce Christians. Did my voice crack? That was so exciting. We are to reproduce Christ into other people. I get goosebumps thinking about it. The fact is, my joy is not preaching. My excitement is not standing up in front. In fact, if I had my way, nobody would ever know me. I am a hermit. I don't like people. <laughs> well, that might not be true. <laughs> I, by nature, am an introvert. But you have to lay some things at the foot of the cross when you accept Christ. Amen. And I don't know what it is that you had to lay at the foot of the cross. I know it was something. But for me, it was the fact that I didn't want to be around anybody. When I first became a Christian, I didn't know what to lay at the foot of the cross. But when I accepted Christ for myself, not as a child, but as an adult, saying, this is my faith, not just the faith of my parents and grandparents. I said, I can't be a hermit. Oh. People say, when are you going to retire? <laughs> when I'm dead. <laughs> I, I, I may not get paid. <laughs> and board members, say, <laughs> I keep begging them to let me off the hook. I may not get paid, but I don't have the right to retire because I accepted Jesus. You accepted Jesus. How do you retire from wanting the kingdom to expand? We exist. And let me give you a couple of scriptures. I haven't given you a lot, but boy, I'll give you a few. Luke 19.10. See, is one that you've heard, one that you memorized in Sunday school probably. It says the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The church is the body, the literal body of Christ. And he is the head. And when the head has a purpose, the body better be carrying it out. Yes? 
There's only two times in my life that my body has not carried out the purpose of my head. Puberty. <laughs> and now it's 68 years old. <laughs> my head thinks I ought to be able to do things. And I remember when my dad said, the time will come that your body will catch down to where your head is known as... No, your head will catch down to where your body is known as... It's been for years. I am there now. In fact... We just had a trip. I was unloading the car. It's all unloaded. I have one more thing. And it wasn't heavy. I reached in the trunk to get it. This is like two days ago. And my back, my head said, you should pick that up. My back said, you should lay down in the trunk. <laughs> my head said, what are you doing? And my back said, I don't know, but this looked good. <laughs> It took me a while to get back out, I must admit. But i got to tell you, the church needs to be carrying out the purpose of the head, seeking and saving that which is lost. And you talked about it already. You saw some people at the Grange and at the various yard sales, and you say, what do we want for them? Do we want just to be their friends? No. We want them to know Jesus. We want them to be a part of our family for all eternity. Amen. And it starts by being their friend. Quick story. I'll make it really quick. I do like to golf. I can only afford one addiction at a time. I, I, I learned this about me. I have a very addictive personality, so I used to be raising horses, and I went from there to hunting and fishing, went from there to move to southern Oregon, and as you know, the deer are the size of a labradoodle. <laughs> a little smaller, maybe, than a labradoodle. And so, anyway, I took up golf. <laughs> and there was a pro at Applegate Golf Course in Grants Pass who didn't yet know Jesus. And after a few years of befriending him, I had the privilege of leading him to Christ and baptizing him. And he said when he accepted Christ, I believe that I have to be a disciple who makes disciples. Put him into an immediate discipleship program. Didn't have time. He's an adult. We couldn't send him off to Bible college, but got him in classes. And by the way, we're working on that along with Boise Bible College and our other Bible colleges. We now have, through Nations University, an online uh, associates, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees available for like $1,200 a year. $1,200 a year. We're I believe of a young person, we need to send them to Bible college. But if you're 35 to 55 and you say, I believe God's calling me in the ministry, or 75 or 95, I don't care. You want to be better educated. We have classes available through a Church of Christ college, doctrinally sound anyway. We got Daniel some classes, and that's been six, seven years ago. Today, he is leading one of our turnaround churches, Lighthouse Christian Church. It's just out of Seaside, Oregon. They're averaging over, they were 40 people and talking about closing. Today they run over 300 in attendance. I'm confident that when I leave here, there will be a text on my phone with pictures of baptisms. It's almost every Sunday he sends me pictures of people that are baptizing, either in the ocean or in the baptistry or a mud puddle, whatever they can find. It has been fun, but that's why we do what we do. And the other scripture that, that I wanted you to remember to back it up with, is Matthew 28, 19 and 20, where we are told to go, wherever you go. It's, the command is not to go, by the way. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth, therefore go, but th that's not in the command form. It's wherever you go and everywhere you go. Here's the command. Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, you have to be careful, I've heard this misquoted, <laughs> Here's the misquote. And teaching them all that I've commanded. Well, that'd be like if, if we get really smart, we'll go to heaven. That isn't how it works. He said, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. Boy, is that a word for Oregon or what? <laughs> it's not enough to know. It's a matter of doing. And we need people who will do the will of our Father. So, folks... The Oregon Christian evangelistic group exists to fulfill the purpose of Christ. That's it. But I want to bring you into the fellowship. And I'll make it brief. 
I know we think about fellowship. I was raised in the church. I know what fellowship is. That's coffee and donuts after church. Isn't it? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Got fellowship hour. Uh, okay, maybe a little more. The reason that the OCEF exists, one of the reasons, is to bring our churches together so that we will have connection, fellowship. <clears throat> Why do we need that? Because this isn't all there is. We have family outside of these walls. Why do we go to church camps? I, I know why. I want my kids, and I wanted my kids in church camps. I wanted them to know that there are other kids that love Jesus. <laughs> why, remember when we used to have, do you have fifth Sunday rallies or any of that kind of stuff? It's when we get churches together. The Oregon Christian Evangelistic Fellowship exists in part just to get churches together. We shouldn't have to recreate the wheel every time we want to do something. I'm going to give you an extreme. I got a call from a church that I was helping. It was uh, a long ways away from Southern Oregon. We were living in Grants Pass at the time, and this was in Walla Walla. That's a long drive. And it was a church that we were helping. In fact, we had OCF had planted that church uh, just a few years before I came on as director, but I was still very active in helping the elders. And I got a call from one of the elders that said that our, our pastor's wife has run off with another man, leaving our preacher and their four kids abandoned. And our preacher has given us his resignation. What do we do? Well, I now am yelling into a cell phone. <laughs> I don't know what you hear on the other end. You do not accept that resignation. I will be there by morning. All night drive. I, I got there. I got a motel. I got two hours sleep. So I can meet first with the elders. And then I met with the preacher and the elders. And here's the message. These kids' mother just abandoned them. This church will not abandon them. You know how we knew how? I'm not usually that decisive. You know how? We had another church that had already gone through it. That had already had this crisis. And some things went well and some things went terribly wrong. But we learned from that experience. See, what I was able to do was connect this eldership with the eldership that had already been through it. And I connected that pastor with the pastor that had already been through it. I'd like to tell you a wonderful story of another coming back, but it didn't happen. Let me tell you another powerful story. The elders gave that preacher, turned out, a 120-day sabbatical. Paid. Fully paid. Clarification is this. You will be in church at least three out of every four Sundays with your kids. Because we want to love on those kids. We want to love on you. We supplied preachers. We supplied the elders, did all the, the shepherding. The church actually grew during that period of time. And I want to tell you that those four kids, out of those four kids, all four in the Lord, three have our Bible College graduates today. The fourth is in the Lord as well. Just chose to go a different direction for schooling. But I got to tell you, when the church steps up, and says, we are your family. It's powerful. But how do we know what to do? Hey, if a sister church has already been through it, let us help. How do we connect people? When your eldership has trouble, your preacher has trouble, when you as an individual are having trouble, how do you know how to get through it? How do you get comfort from God if you've not been through it? Well, I, here's another scripture. And it's my, this is one of my life verses. It's in 2 Corinthians. This is one to memorize, folks, because... Everybody goes through hard times, right? Okay. You haven't been through a crisis yet? Mm -hmm. Day ain't over. <laughs> Second Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 3 and 4. I'm going to give you a Reader's Digest abbreviated quote, because I can't remember the whole thing. But blessed be the God of all comfort and Father of all mercies. But blessed be the God and Father of all comfort who comforts us in our every affliction. Not out of our afflictions, but in. While we're in the affliction, he comforts us so that we might comfort others with the comfort that we ourselves were given. You find yourself in a crisis. I don't, 
I don't rejoice in crises. But I rejoice in the fact that I know that God will use that crisis so I can help somebody else that maybe doesn't know Jesus who's going through this. We've been through cancer four times. And I say we, even though it was Sherry's body. <laughs> we have been through cancer four times. We think we're cancer free at this time, but you know, nobody gets out of this life alive. But what that has provided is the opportunity with some of our non-Christian friends and Christian friends to say, well, here's how God brought us through it. And it's given an opportunity to share Jesus. We are in fellowship, church to church, so that we can comfort one another. One another. So that we don't have to recreate the wheel every time <coughs> something happens. I imagine you as a church have been through some things that you could help another church go through. Together, yes, we plant churches. Together, we, we rescue churches. But together, we're just there for each other as well. Thank you for that. Anyway, that's why the OCEF is the Oregon Christian Evangelistic Fellowship. That's us. That's you. We do other things. Um, we do things like uh, financial planning ministry. Years ago, we started paying in as a, as a group uh, to financial planning ministry, which is a group that does living trusts for families. Um, we pay into that every year so that we can offer it uh, to our local churches that support OCEF to say, you have families that would like to have a living trust. And I'm not going to get into great depth on what that is, but the difference between a living trust and a, and a will, a will, you have a will, everything still has to go through probate. The attorneys are going to get 6 to 10 percent of whatever you leave behind. And if you have a living trust, if you've gone through that work, then it does not go through probate. And think about it, 6 to 10 percent of your whatever that would have gone to an attorney would, now if you have attorneys here, just get over it. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you rather leave that to your church, to your camp, somewhere that will do something with that little bit that would take the gospel the next step forward even after we're gone? So that we've, we've done that. I teach a class once a year at Boise Bible College. I do some pinch hitting at uh, what's now called Bushnell in their Bible department if I get asked. But really, this is just what we all do together. Wherever it is, this is what we do. And um, thank you again. But don't stop. People in this area need Jesus desperately. You got to see some of them at the yard sales. Don't give up. Keep praying. Keep loving people, even when they're not lovable, on Jesus' behalf. That's what we do. So thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's good to see you guys again. And uh, we see each other periodically, but it's usually like Oregon Christian Convention or something that we bump into each other at. But uh, that's fun as well. So I'll stop talking. I don't know what happens next, but uh, I bet somebody will stand up. So let, me, let me pray for you. I want to pray. In fact, let's do a little different. Would you picture someone right now in your life that you know, whether it's a, a family member, a child, a grandchild, neighbor, co-worker that needs Jesus? Can you, do you all know somebody that needs Jesus? I asked that at a church one time, and nobody raised their hand. I said, you people really need to get out. <laughs> I want you to picture somebody that you know that needs Jesus right now. You pray for them while I pray for you to be able to share a word with them. I, I know we're afraid to talk, but you know, some, we will share the gospel with everybody, and when necessary, we'll use words. So let's, let me pray for you. Father, right now, we are picturing and we're lifting up before you people that we know that don't know you yet. Lord, we'd love to have them in heaven with us. So, Father, I pray for this church family that they will be your arms, your hands, your voice into other people's lives. 
Father, I thank you that you've given us the opportunity to love people on your behalf, and may that be today. And today, Father, when we go from here, we go as your disciples, wanting to make disciples who will make disciples who will make more disciples. And together, Father, we thank you for the difference that we will be able to make, that you will make through us, in our community, in our state, our country, and in this world. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank you.